I think we can't make the mistake of designing an, an optimal or academically perfect HR operating model in a vacuum. It, it, it really must be aligned with your fundamental business strategy and the overall operating model. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down on proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to today's discussion. I'm Ben Eubanks, and I am so glad to have you here for the, today's conversation. As you can tell from the teaser, we're going to talk about designing an HR function that is responsive, agile, and aligned with the business. I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Lauren Dupree and Dominique Brewer from Decatur Pharmaceuticals recently. In the discussion, we covered everything from how Takeda started their transformation journey, coincidentally, right at the time COVID was hitting, how the team is weaving in equity, not just in hiring, but across all areas of the business, and more. This is the start of an incredible series. Over the next month or two, I'm getting an opportunity to speak with a select group of IBM talent and transformation clients that are leading insightful, innovative HR transformation journeys. You can learn more about this at ibm.biz slash talent acquisition. I'll make sure that link is in the show notes, but one more time for you, ibm.biz slash talent acquisition. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to rate and review it on Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're even now on Spotify and all the places. That's enough of the niceties. Let's dive in and hear from Lauren and Dominique. Hey, everyone. Welcome to We're Only Human. I am Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad to have you here. So if you've listened for any length of time, you know I am a dad of four, so I am not allowed to have favorites. But today's discussion is one I've been looking forward to the most over the last few weeks. We have not one but two amazing and dynamic guests to share with us some of what's happening in the trenches. So if you're an enterprise HR or talent leader, Grab the popcorn, get comfortable in your seat because you're in for a big treat today. I'd like to welcome Lauren Dupree and Dominic Brewer from Takeda to talk to us about some of their strategy, some of their talent, some of their approach this year of all years. And I'm excited to dig into this. Lauren, Dominique, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So let's start us off as we always do. Let's get to know both of you a little bit. Lauren, why don't you tell us a little bit who you are and what you do? Yeah, happy to. So first, again, thank you for having us and, and really looking forward to the discussion. So I am the head of HR for the U.S. at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. In that role, I, I oversee all of our HR strategy, including talent, organization, D&I, employee relations, really the whole spectrum of HR for our employees in the U.S. For those of you who may not know um, as much about Takeda, we have a number of, of business lines and in the U.S., uh, spanning from oncology to vaccines, R&D, manufacturing, and then we really touch most geographies across the U.S. with our headquarters being located in Boston. Wonderful. Thank you for that background, too, because I, I have to admit that I had heard the name, but had to dig in a little bit, too, in my, my research for the conversation today to make sure I was up to date on that. So, Dominique, your turn, ma'am. Hi, thank you again for having me. Very excited to, to be a participant today instead of a listener. Um, and I am one of the talent acquisition uh, leaders. I currently support recruitment for the United States Commercial Business Unit and Global Commercial Business Unit. And I've been with Takeda for about four years and work very closely with Lauren and the stakeholders to make sure that we're considered as a you know employer of choice. <laughs> Wonderful. I love that. And we'll actually dig into some of that probably in the conversation today, talking about some of the changes you've made, some of the new approaches you've taken, things like that. So I'm really excited to dig into some of those. So to set the stage a little bit, this year, for anyone listening, it's not a surprise, this year has been a perfect storm of change in so many ways. And one of the things that we were talking about the other day, prepping for this, thinking through the things that we wanted to draw out the best parts of your story, one of the things you mentioned was this HR transformation journey that you had started right at the smack dab in the middle of this whole thing, you had planned that and it, it hit the timing was either perfect or, or terrible. We'll talk about more of which one that is, but hit right at the beginning of this. So Lauren, talk to us a little about that transformation journey on your HR, for your HR function, what that looks like and why you started that. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, for those of you who who may not know um, as much about Takeda, Takeda acquired Shire Pharmaceuticals approximately two years ago. And with that, it was really a, a large integration, two like-sized companies coming together, about 25,000 employees from each company coming together to be a, a shared. And with that, HR had a lot of work to do, as I'm sure many of them, in supporting that integration and driving it forward. But we also knew that we needed to transform ourselves as an HR function in order to support really this, this new organization with a new strategy, a new footprint, a new portfolio as well. But we decided to wait a bit um, to allow the HR function to best support the rest of the business. And so we did that really for the first year of integration. And then as we wrapped up 2019 and headed into 2020, it was our turn. We had done the work behind the scenes to evaluate really the best HR operating model for Takeda aligned with our business strategy, looking outside the company for best practices. But I think even more importantly, looking inside to say, you know, what is our business strategy? What is our operating model as a company? And how do we build a best in class HR function to really enable us to create an exceptional employee experience that would enable and support our patients and our business? And so with that, as we entered into 2020, we were ready to begin implementation of our new HR model. And we can share more about more specifically what that looks like later in the conversation. We actually announced that HR model in February to our global HR organization, as well as across the business. And probably all of you remember that that's about when we saw COVID really beginning to emerge outside of Asia, outside of Europe to be truly impact us globally. We announced, like I said, in February, and it was only a couple weeks later that we had convened crisis committees across the company to address COVID. And, and that actually in mid-March that we announced globally that all of our employees, where they could, would be asked to work remotely, um, as well as travel restrictions, et cetera. So we really saw this perfect storm for the HR function of the midst of a new transformation that you know, would require new organization new capabilities, new technology, a new organizational structure, but also at a time when HR was being called upon globally, and of course in the U.S., to support and drive changes related to COVID that I think all of us had never seen before. Um, so it was quite a time, as you can imagine. Tremendous. I said perfect storm. You echoed that a little bit. And one of the things you touched on was this reconstruction component, right? We, we changed how it looks. We, you modified the fundamental structure of your HR operations. And I'd love to, to just dive into that for a little bit, because that's one of those things that you, you might read about in an article or you hear someone talk about on a stage and it sounds, it sounds kind of amorphous. It's hard to wrap your arms around. It's hard to understand what that means. And so I'd love for you to take a, take a few minutes and dive into some of the pieces of that functionally, how did that change? What does it look like now? Um, how's that working for you? What's the feedback been? Lots of questions there. I can touch on some of those more as we go, but I just love for you to dive into that a little bit because it sounds like it hit at the right time and it, time will tell, I guess, if it was the, how well that move enabled you to shift and adapt in the midst of everything that's going on this year. I'd love for you to dive into some of those specifics if you don't mind. Laura and Dominique, which one, which one of you wants to, to start off there? how you reconstructed that and what that now looks like? Definitely, Ben. It's a, it's a great question because, I mean, for me, I think as HR professionals, you often read about, you hear about HR transformation and operating models and the countless options really that we have. For, for me, I think it's always, what's the specifics? And I, I think that's what you're asking. And so I, I want to start answering the question by saying, we're not done yet. It's been six months since we announced, but we're still very much in implementation. And for me, that's because this is really, truly an HR transformation that goes down to all of our technology systems, goes to our operating model, goes to the talent that we're bringing in. And so I definitely think we are not done yet. But to answer your question, so what does this look like? For us, our operating model that we defined, it has four parts. And so the first part of that is our embedded HR teams. And so these are probably most traditionally, you think of these as kind of your HR business partner types of teams. But for us and Takeda, we have a very locally empowered operating model as a business. 
And so we felt that it was important, and actually you could say it was essential, that our HR operating model also be the same. And so we have put most of our HR resources really close to the business in this embedded HR model. So in that, you'll see HR business partners, you'll see talent acquisition, you'll see learning and talent partnership, org effectiveness, you'll even see DNI. And so we have these embedded HR teams now set up for all of our business units and functions across the company. And so some of those, as I mentioned, those might be our global R&D organization, our global manufacturing, we have an oncology business unit, et cetera. So all of those will have an embedded HR team that will be close to the business to really drive the business strategy through HR. The second part of our operating model is also one I'm sure that, that most of your listeners are familiar with, and those are the global COEs, so centers of excellence. We made, though, a conscious um, decision to name them centers of excellence and innovation, because the expectation is not that these centers just be experts in everything and how we've always done it, but that they are really where we're looking to bring in external innovation, as well as drive innovation nascent in our company as well. So the emphasis that not only is it excellence, but it's truly innovation that we'll be looking to these centers for. And so these global centers are designed to really support and and pull through and meet the needs of the embedded HR, but also to build up best in class and innovative programs. Examples here would be our global approach to performance management, how we think about leadership behaviors, our total rewards philosophies and strategies. And so in that we have, we have several of these COEIs, total rewards is one of them, as I mentioned, learning and talent management, people insights and analytics, as well as a somewhat smaller COEI, but an important one as well of employee and labor relations. So then the third element of the model is also one that, that I think many of your listeners might be familiar with, and that is our business solutions COEI. So going beyond services and into solutions. At Takeda, we call it Takeda Business Solutions, TBS. And that is a key and important part of our model that will really execute on what we would call the essential work. Some of it might seem operational or even more tactical, and, but as we see, it is really the foundation of what we do and how we serve our employees. And then the final part of the operating model might be a little more unique, I would say, and that's what we call our, our people advisory group or PAG. And so we will have a PAG for all of our large regions that includes employee and labor relations, diversity and inclusion, employee engagement, and employee communications, among other things. Employee policies is in that as well. And so for our large regions or countries, as well as Japan and Switzerland, we'll have that fully built out PAG um, group. We will also have PAG support across some of the other smaller countries in which we operate, but the scope of the PAG will be slightly smaller there. So it's these four elements, the embedded HR, the COEIs, TBS, as well as PAG, that make up our new HR operating model. And as I said, we began the rollout and the announcement of this back in February, but as you might be able to tell, it, it's a large transformation, and so we expect this to you know, be a, a multi-year journey before we're fully, fully implemented. So, Dominique, we heard the broader HR perspective there. What does it look like from someone that is working every single day with their feet rooted in talent acquisition? What does it look like for you operationally? It looks very interesting, and it looks like a silver lining. And, and I say a silver lining because a lot of people have questioned, why would you move from a centralized model into a decentralized format? And, and what does that even mean, and how do you navigate through that to make sure that you're effective and efficient. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great opportunity to really make sure that you can move into an end-to-end -end consultative approach and partner across all of those, you know, primary points, both internally and externally. Attracting talent is not just about going to market, but it's also about making sure that there's that full review of the existing workforce as well. And so how we do all of this, uh, being embedded in the business and having that 
direct line creates a different level of awareness that would be missed if you were remaining in a centralized type of model. And so as you're thinking about processes, policies, and programming, and adding that lens of DE&I and how you can support an inclusive work environment across all of those areas, not just from talent management and acquisition, but everything the business is doing with the TA team being embedded in that way, it allows you to really consider a holistic approach as you're also thinking about the deployment of, of how that works and what that looks like. And so I think you can become more effective and have better overall relationships and partnerships to make sure that there is appropriate consideration, relationship building, pull through and consideration so that we do have that ability to have true end-to-end -end management, acquiring, retaining, and including people. Really intriguing. One of the words you there you used there was relationships. And that's actually something I wanted to follow up with Lauren too on is the very first thing you said, Lauren, is this was driven in part by the things that we value as a company. We value localized leadership. We value having authority in those areas when we can. So they can make decisions quickly. They can be agile if they need to be. And so you've adopted an HR model that supports that, follows that by having these embedded, embedded HR leaders in these areas. And I'm curious, what has the feedback been from the business, from those partnerships, those relationships you have as you started to push the resources into those areas to support them as they need it, instead of having to, to call into a COE and that being the only support they have, what's that response from them been? Yeah, the response has been phenomenal. I will say when I first shared with some of our executive leaders the model where we had landed, there was a lot of excitement, particularly, and I think this is kudos to the team that we had, but particularly excitement around talent acquisition, coming in and, and being closer to the business. Leaders in the business really value at Takeda HR, but they value every aspect of it. They see and, and want talent acquisition to be part of the business team. They see the importance of that. There's really probably nothing more important for a company than who you bring in, but that's who your company is. And, and talent acquisition is a key part of that. But there was also excitement across the board in terms of some of the flexibility that they would have with their embedded HR team, right? The ability to flex across your talent partners to say, as we look at our business strategy, we know we're going to be investing in culture more this year. So we might want to bring in someone to the HR team that's, that's really dedicated to organization and culture. Or as we've seen with many of uh, teams, an increased investment in diversity and inclusion and the ability to you know, flex to that and allow the business units and functions to you know, bring in these dedicated resources when and where they need it aligned with their business strategy. So the feedback has been excellent. I would say if there's been any further opportunity, it's really been to educate our leaders and our employees and our managers on you know, how this HR model really works. Where do you go for what, who's doing it, what, how does it really you know, work in terms of governance and decision making? And we're still absolutely on that journey. I think we're still on that journey for, for HR. I will tell you as an HR leadership team, Several times in, in the six months since we began rolling this out, we've come together to say, okay, on this one topic that's now come up, what's the racy? Who's responsible here? Who's accountable? Who's making the decision? Who owns it? And we've just worked it out ourselves to look at the model and, and dig into some of the specifics. Again, we've done a ton of work. We have more charts than probably anybody could ever really read on kind of <laughs> accountabilities across the model. But when it comes down to it, it's really using those specific examples as well to bring the model to life for everyone. One of the one of the specific groups you talked about, your PAGs, your people advisory groups, you touched on different ones that you have, employee and labor, engagement, comms. And one of those you touched on was diversity and inclusion. And I know that's another area that you and the team have been spending a lot of time on this year, trying to make sure you, you get it right. And I'd love to take a little bit of time to dig into this one because in general, I actually talked to someone just last week about this. We were d digging into bias and DNI in the business, and their whole lens entirely was around hiring. And anything else beyond that, they they're like, oh, we don't have time for this. I, I can't dig into that yet. And I'd love to talk with 
about how you've approached this, what sort of innovations you've had there, because you've taken a much broader approach that I think is really intriguing. And for companies that are thinking, okay, we've, we're doing good things on hiring, but we want to go beyond that. There's not a lot of great use cases and stories out there. And so I'm really hoping that Takeda becomes the, one of the leaders in that area. In addition to all the other great things you're doing on the operating model side, I'd love for you to talk a little about what you're doing there, how you're exploring, how to take that more deeply into the organization and what that impact's been. Absolutely. Hiring is so important, right? As you think of DNI, and I, I, I think it's probably one of the, the first suspects that you think of. For us, as we began you know, thinking more about DNI and how it was going to be really a, a key part of our business strategy in 2020, what we saw that we needed to do was to really expand the aperture. And what I mean when I say that is to go beyond in a core HR elements of how you might think about DNI, and that might be recruiting and training and learning and development programs. Those are critical, and we absolutely will be and have been investing in those. But we look at the core mission and purpose of our company, and that is to deliver in a bit of medicine to our patients. And what we see there is an opportunity for us to really have impact on diversity, equity, and inclusion beyond the walls of Takeda, beyond our own employees through the work that we do to really help improve access to medicines, understand underserved populations, think about DEI practices in every aspect of what we do. And so with that, we have stood up a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion council that will be charged with owning our strategy in this area and ensuring sustainable execution. And the work that council does, 75% of it is outside of HR. There's work streams around sales and marketing, around our, our medical group and what the work they're doing, how we engage with patients, policies, the vendors that we work with, and really holistically everything that our business does. There are work streams. I think, as you said, there are work streams on talent and talent acquisition and development. There's work streams on learning and training and, and you know, talent development as well there. But as I said, it's really looking more broadly to how can we have a broader impact on the communities that we operate in, as well as our broader industry and looking to be a leader there. And Lauren, if I may, and then to your point earlier, it's very interesting that you said a lot of the organizations you're speaking with have said, hey, we don't have time to look at this other stuff. We need to really focus on just acquiring talent. Yes. Uh, earlier when I said the processes, policies, and programming to support an inclusive work environment and workplace, I, I meant that truly throughout all of the organization. What we've been seeing with the convergence of COVID-19 and the the racist things that are happening in, in the United States right now is that people are still looking for jobs and that content of review has changed quite a bit, right? People are not just looking at what is the title and how much am I going to be paid, but they want to know what is the culture of the organization. And, and at Takeda, we're very focused on Takedaism, as we call them, the fairness, integrity, honesty, perseverance. And our president has operationalized those into patient trust, reputation, and business. And so everything that we do starts with the patient, every single decision we make. And in the marketplace, especially our recruiting team, those are the questions that people are asking of them right now. So not just talk to me about this job, but what is the culture of the organization, of the team? What is the leadership style? What are you not only doing for your employees during this time, but what are you doing for the greater good of society? So as you think about that corporate social responsibility, that is a huge component of how people are evaluating, do I want to leave where I am? And even if they're unemployed, how might this impact my livelihood and my family? And so Takeda and the way that we've operated and with Lauren and the executive leadership teams focus on making sure that it's been embedded throughout everything we do. That is one of the ways that we've been able to successfully navigate through this unchartered time that we're all dealing with right now. I would say that's something we should really, you know, implore people to look at is, is, is the rest of it, because that's super important. 
I want to actually ask you a follow-up, Dominique, if you don't mind. There's the thing that came to mind as you were sharing that is my favorite, my favorite behavioral scientist, uh, behavioral economist is Dan Ariely. And one of the things his research has shown is if we can show people the impact of their work, right? You're not just filling, filling a slot as a recruiter. You're not just building a widget, but you're doing this thing and here's how it fits into the big picture. And here's the impact we're making on the world. If you can help them see that, they're willing to work so much harder. They're willing to put more effort in. They're willing to really give that effort that they wouldn't have otherwise if they thought they were just building a widget or you know, put, putting a butt in the seat, as we sometimes say in recruiting. They Instead of doing that, they see the bigger picture. I'm curious, how have how have you and the rest of the team at Takeda helped those recruiters mm -hmm. to have those conversations? Because I know that when I was recruiting, I never would have, we talked about culture some, but it mm -hmm. wasn't at that level. That's really specific. And that's, mm -hmm. that's also exciting that candidates are bringing that up. They're putting some pressure on employers to think through those things. And mm -hmm. I know that Takeda already is thinking about that. And so you're ahead of the curve, but how do you prepare your recruiting team to have those conversations and think about how to engage those candidates when they're asking things that they never have in the past? It's a great question, and, and I think it's one that I have to say I'm super appreciative of being a part of an organization that focuses on its people and really has done the assessment of culture. And I truly mean that it is the air you breathe or the water you swim in. And so not having to reassess who we are as an organization has allowed for people to just operate from a place of positive regard and always considering other people and how that impacts our ability to reach patients. And so when we have these conversations in recruiting, I have to say again, it, I'm, I'm appreciative to have such a team that is really focused on being a good representative and being open and available for people as they're looking for new opportunities. Your job is your livelihood. And so we have really been particularly focused in this being embedded into the, the areas that we're working from a business perspective and making sure that we understand end to end what their goals and focuses are as well. So that through that relationship and partnership, having a conversation is it's an easier thing to do. It's just an inherent part of our process because that's how our culture, that's the foundation of Takeda is that ability to be open, honest, and engaged. And when the research shows to your end, McKinsey, Deloitte, every organization that's publishing data shows that when employees think their organization is committed to and supportive of diversity and they feel included, innovation increases, the buy-in increases. And when our stakeholders feel like our goal and purpose is to help them to achieve the goal of being available for patients and providers and the greater community, it's easier to really quickly in real time address and work together towards solutions. And that includes every single aspect of talent acquisition and management. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, it does. It does. Absolutely. I know you'd have a good one. You'd have a good one uh, there in your hip pocket ready to pull out. And that was a really good response to that because I'm, again, it's not. I, I didn't want someone to hear that and think, oh gosh, if someone asked that of my recruiters, I don't know how they'd respond. Guess what? You might want to start expecting that. With yeah, the, and they with... call. We have open forums with the recruiting team during our calls where we just say, hey, let's take a second away from process and let's talk about what are you hearing? What's being shared with you from your stakeholders and from your candidate pools? It's not just people that might fit a mold of being an underrepresented person or protected category of individual, everyone is asking questions that hit these areas. And it's like nothing we've ever seen before. And by having that open discussion, it helps everyone on the team to consider a different perspective. This is where diversity of thought comes in. And hearing and having these conversations in the dialogue helps them become more comfortable and prepared to have those conversations and discussions consistently. Thank you for that. So Lauren, I have one last question for you. As I'm listening to all of these insights here, this story, you've mentioned a couple of times, you're six or so months into this and it, you still have plenty of runway to go before you're done with this transformation. And even then it'll probably be, you'll be iterating on that for some time to come. If someone's listening into this conversation today and they're thinking, I really, we need to do something like this. We need to change how we've done it. We need to shake this up. Maybe this year expose the cracks in the foundation that they didn't realize were there before. 
what piece of practical advice might you give someone that's listening in that's thinking, I need to change my model. Anything that you are like either looking back now, I wish I had known this when we started, that would have been helpful or a way that you went about how you selected the model that really fit in with the culture of the company. Any ideas or suggestions there that might help someone listening in to, to take the next step like you have? Yeah, absolutely. For me, and I, I think the success that we've had and, and, and how well the model has been received, it, it comes down to this, and, and it, it was front of mind as we were designing it, is keeping at the front of your mind, what is your business strategy? And what is the operating model of, of your firm and company? And how can HR best align and drive that? I think we can't make the mistake of designing an, an optimal or academically perfect HR operating model in a vacuum. It, it, it really must be aligned with your fundamental business strategy and the overall operating model. I think if you get those things right, Anything that you design and implement, I think, will be successful. And then I, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but I, you know, I think it rings true to, to HR from there. It's all about the people, who you bring in, how you operate, and the change management and the culture that you drive within your HR team as well. I think I am so grateful for the, the team that we have. And Dominique is a great example of just a fantastic HR leader who has been able to be extremely successful in the model prior and is now pivoting and innovating in the new model and really accelerating the impact that she's able to deliver as well. So I think that would be my advice. Wonderful. I love that. I love that. I was, you always expect someone to, here's the secret that no one knows, but that's one of those things. It's like, just get down to when they say what takes, what makes a great baseball player, a great, you know, athlete, like they just do the fundamentals, do those things that you know you need to do that are hard to do that no one else wants to do. Just do those things and it's going to work out. It's going to lead to the right outcomes there. Dominique, I'm going to actually pitch that question over to you because Lauren gives such a great response. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Any piece of advice for for an organization, whether it's broadly, hey, we're changing our our model of town acquisition, pushing into really being responsive to those local business units, or if it's something even on the DEI side, if there's something that that you'd give someone a piece of advice on how how to tackle that, how to approach that, anything that you have to share here, I know the audience would love to hear. No, thank you. I and, and Lauren, thank you for the kind comment. I'm appreciative of having such an inclusive HR leader as well that really looks at the macro and micro level and holistic views all simultaneously. That's something you don't get very often. So we're very fortunate in that. And also with our executive leaders, I would say then that cross-functional partnership and being very deliberate about making sure that you do have that representation and consideration, going through the diligence processes as you're building and knowing that failure is inevitable, but the opportunity to learn from that and come back to the table to converge and come up with a solution that limits the impact to stakeholders and all parties, that's truly a gift. And that's something that having that model of cross-functional collaboration really provides within an organization. I think there's some places where it's done extremely well, but we all have opportunity. And and that is one of the, again, gifts of Takeda is just being set up to work that way. And so one easy thing is just making sure that if you're not working in that manner, it's a quick pivot that allows you to be more agile and make that adjustment and it could have tremendous impact to all parties. The only other thing that I would say is that this journey of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I I would like to ascertain it more to a relay race where you're going to have different individuals and different groups that you're handing off that baton to and sometimes you're running side by side and and sometimes the parties change but just really highlighting that there may be fatigue and it doesn't you know work in a siloed fashion like you're going to need support and collaboration and partnership and so knowing that it's a journey uh, there's going to be times where there's failure but again that partnership will help to have a better outcome and the transparency of communication throughout that journey. It's not a one size fits all and there will be some fatigue, but if you have that support, there'll be a better outcome. So that's all I would say, give yourself some grace in that. 
give yourself some grace. I've used the word grace a lot in the last six months and, and hopefully we'll continue to. That's one of the things we can all we can all stand to offer a little more of and accept a little more of probably in, in our daily work. I love that that piece there. This really is a journey and not a destination. Right? And that's tremendous. This has been such an intriguing conversation. I have taken a ton of notes in the discussion, learning from both of you. If someone wants to just broadly learn more about Takeda, the work that the organization is doing, again, as you said earlier, you're in the health space. And so you have no doubt been busy this year on the business side, in addition to all the things working on the HR side. If someone's curious, just want to learn more about Takeda and the work that the organization is doing in the community, what's the best way to find that out? So you can visit Takeda.com. We have a lot of information about who we are, what we do, our people, our corporate uh, responsibility is all listed there. We have focus on patients, providers. We also have TakedaJobs.com if anyone is interested in finding new opportunities and always welcome uh, opportunity for reciprocity. So connecting via LinkedIn would be happy to have additional conversation. Lauren, I'm not sure if there's anything you might wanna highlight in addition. No, I, I think you covered them. I would say LinkedIn, we are, we are pretty active there as well. Um, posting a lot of the activities that we're doing as, as well as you know thoughts and words from various leaders that I think give give people a real flavor of, of who some of the real people and, and leaders are at the company so check us out there I would say as well excellent I'll make sure we we get those links into the show notes so people can check that out can follow up can again just follow the work that you and the broader team at Decatur are doing I appreciate each of you for sake take some time out of your day. This has been a tremendous discussion and I know the audience appreciated it. I definitely have. And um, just want to thank you both for your time. And thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yeah. Ter- thank you. This is, this is great. Wonderful. To everybody else, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll catch you next time on We Are Only Human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com. 